John chapter 1. We made it as far as verse 28, but we're going to back up a little bit. Going to repeat the introduction a little bit too, since we're still at the beginning of the book. It's the Gospel of John, we believe, written by the Apostle John, who at the time that he actually walked with Jesus was probably an older teenager. Uh, so, 17, 18 years old, maybe. I don't know, you can probably find some who would put him younger than that, some would put him a little older than that, but we'll just kind of hit right there, 17, 18 years old. Imagine the things that he saw at that age, walking with Jesus for three and a half years. That's, <clears throat> that's pretty amazing. Um, this gospel is a little different than the other three. The other three are called the synoptic gospels because they are so similar. Each spends a little more time in different things, but they're, they have more things in common, more stories in common than they do with John. Uh, John has, I think, only two of the miracles that he talks about uh, that are actually shared in the other gospels. So there, there are a couple of stories that are common to all four of the gospels. Uh, but the reality of it is that each one kind of has its own vantage point of who Jesus was. Uh, that doesn't mean there's a whole bunch of contradictions. That just means they're looking from there where they were at in their walk with the Lord or in following somebody who was walking with the Lord because Luke uh, was a, a friend of, of Paul. He was not one of the apostles and Mark was not one of the apostles, although he probably had time to hang around them a little bit when they were in the area. But for the most part, he was a, a disciple of Peter's. And so some people even believe Mark is really more the gospel of Peter than it is Mark, that it may have just been dictated or at least taken from spending so much time with Peter. Each book, though, presents him and, and has a different, uh, prevent, presents Jesus in a different light, has a different target audience, kind of. Uh, Matthew is very a very Jewish book written to the Jews, uh, very centered on Jesus being the Messiah, the Son of God. Uh, he, he focuses a lot on what Jesus said, more of Jesus' words recorded there. In particular, the great discourses in the Gospels are recorded in Matthew, um, as well as more details to the parables and probably more parables than even Luke Mark was kind of focused on the Romans. It was a very Roman letter, speaking of Jesus as a servant. Matthew took Jesus' lineage back to Abraham. Father Abraham, father of the Jews, as a good Jew would, they would find their identity in Abraham. We'll even see in the book of John, uh, at some point, the Pharisees talking about their father and knowing who they come from. Uh, Jesus gets himself into a little bit of trouble with them because he, he claims to have been before Abraham. And, and so, uh, but we'll, we'll see that. Uh, Mark has no lineage of Jesus because Mark presents him as the servant or the suffering servant. Sometimes we, we like to recall it. Um, it's very snapshotty, just quick stories. Um, it's all about what he did, his work. Luke talks about the humanness of, of Jesus, um, presents him as a man, talks about his compassion, uh, and his was kind of written more to, I mean, you could say, Rome, some people say that Luke's two writings, the book of Acts and the gospel itself, may very well have been a defense for Paul when he went to Caesar. And that Theophilus, that the books were uh, addressed to, could possibly have been even a lawyer for Paul. We don't know that to be fact. Um, it's at least likely that that uh, Theophilus may have been a master of Luke's. Because being a doctor, you usually served one person. It wasn't like you put a shingle out and everybody came to see you. It, it, you were somebody important, owned you. You were kind of their slave, but you were still... Uh, even though you had the, the idea or the, the knowledge of medicine of the time. And 
then John, of course, focuses on his deity and him being the son of God. You'll have seven I am statements, the proclamation of Jesus saying that he's God. Uh, seven miracles that speak to that. Uh, five of them are only found in John. He has the longest prayer in John chapter 17. The longest prayer in the New Testament. Uh, that is where you go to read Jesus' prayer for you. He prays for the apostles first. And then he prays for everybody who would follow after the apostles. So those who would come to faith because of the, the work that would be done through the apostles to everyone else. So if you want to see what Jesus' prayer for you was, you go read John chapter 17. It's, it's pretty moving. In John, it mentions Jesus Christ or Jesus or Christ 170 times just in this one book. And the word believe is in it 100 times. And in 20 verse 13, he tells us flat out, that's why he wrote this to begin with, was that you might believe. All these things I've written so that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, there are some kind of cool details about all of this. Uh, and we kind of went over them a little bit uh, last week. But while the Israel was in the wilderness and they had received from God the Ten Commandments and then the plans for the tabernacle and how that would be constructed and how they were set up or to set up and take down the tabernacle and and the duties of the priests and all. Um, they also had a way that they set up the camp around the tabernacle. Now there would be three tribes to the north, three tribes to the south, three to the east, and three to the west. And so if you looked at Israel as a camp you know, from a high point, you would see a cross in the, in the wilderness. Because they were to set up no farther north, like the... The tribes in the east and the west would set up no farther north and no farther south than the Levites. And the same with the tribes to the north and the south. They would set up no farther east or no farther west than, than the, the Levites. And the tabernacle was to be right in the middle of that. Now, when we sang the, the song today, uh, Take Me In. I, I've always loved that song. We learned that song in the 90s when Petra had it on one of their, their praise albums. Love that song. And it now, and since then, I've learned all of this since then about the tabernacle and, and the, any studies that I've done on it have been since I learned that song. And so I had a better understanding of even what they were singing about and, and how amazing it is. And uh, it's it, that song is even more special to me now. So... In these tribes now, each tribe would have their own standard or their own banner that they would have up so that everybody in that tribe knew to set up around in their own tribes. So the family groups kind of stayed together. But in the areas that your family set up in, you had one standard that you were to rally around if there was an emergency, if there was an attack, whatever, you would rally to that standard. Or if the camp had picked up and moved, then you knew where that main standard set up, your family then set up on that standard again. And those standards would have symbols on them. And so to the east was Judah. And Judah's symbol was a lion. And to the west was Ephraim, and his symbol was an ox. And to the south was Reuben, and his symbol was a man. And to the north was Dan, and his symbol was an eagle. And so if you were in the family groups that went with Dan or went with Judah or whatever, you would always know, you go and you begin to set up on their standard first, and then the standard of your own tribe that you were a part of. So you had three tribes to the north, three to the south, three to the east, three to the west. These are also the faces of the cherubim that are around the throne of God. So if you look in Ezekiel where they're described, and in Revelation where they're described, they each have four faces. In Revelation, John just describes them, each one as having one face. Ezekiel describes them as each one having all four faces. John just saw one face on each one. It doesn't mean they were different 
beings or, or whatever. It's not a contradiction. It's just how God revealed them to him. But the reality of it is, is all four faces were still present. And so on each side, they had the face of a man, the face of an ox or a beast, the face of a lion, the face of an eagle. And so the, the lion, we know Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And Matthew very much, again, focuses on that, the king, the, the Messiah. And the one side where they would have the ox, that would apply to Mark being presenting Jesus as the servant. And Luke, I said already, focused very much on the human side of Jesus. And John, John focuses on the deity, which the eagle would represent the deity or the, the God himself. So that was how the camp was set up. And right again in the middle is the the tabernacle. Now from outside of the camp, if you could see the tabernacle, it didn't look like much. It's covered with animal skins on the outside. Uh, some think even the, the last animal skin that would cover that you would see from outside the camp was just a black, uh, a, a black uh, skin, a black color or a very dark color, which we could easily say kind of represents the sin of man on, on Jesus. I mean, if you're looking at him on the cross, on the cross is where he took on the sin of the world. But even if you don't want to go there, if that's too much of a picture, it's still not a lot to look at. A black tent in the middle of this camp that's set up weird like nobody else sets up, in, which I actually think is even in military sense is a, is a pretty, pretty defensible way to set up your camp. I mean, you're not going to attack straight into an end, are you? Because then you're, you're just going to fight straight in to one end that gives the other camps time to come around and and take care of you you've always got somebody to the rear of the camp if you try to attack into the into the corners of the camp then you've got two you you've got six tribes that can collapse down on you right from the from the head on to all the way down around the sides of you and, and kind of flank you so it's a pretty defensible camp but you you see this, this tent that they're guarding in the middle. And you see the smoke and you, you can see them making the, the sacrifices. The altar was outside of the camp or outside of the tent. I mean, not outside the camp, but outside of the tent. And the laver, the big bowl was outside of the tent. And we, we mentioned, I think, last week the laver a little bit because the word of God is eternal. And... The laver, I believe, represents that. It was a bowl of water. Every time the priests went by, they washed in it. And, and so their service was washed. It was, it was part of their service to wash, to make sure they were ceremonially, ceremonially clean as they went back and forth between the holy place, the tent, and, and the altar. And carrying in the, the sacrifices for the people and whatever other services they did. They had to wash every time before they went in. And so that really, when you look at the, or the, everything in the tabernacle has a dimension to it. Detailed to how big something was supposed to be from the candlesticks, or not candlesticks, but the lampstand, and the, the Ark of the Covenant, and the table of showbread, and the altar itself, all these dimensions. The only thing that has no dimension is that bowl of water. And so people who like to pay attention to all the details suggest that that speaks to the eternality of God's word. If we're washing ourselves in the word of God, it will never run out. There, there's no limit to what, be careful how I say this, but just there, there's no end to God's word. And so purposely, God didn't give a dimension to that, to that labor, to that bowl. But on the inside of that, that tent, when you go in, you see boards for walls that are covered in gold. You see tapestries in, in purple and in, in that 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 uh, would speak of the royalty or the God, the the Messiah, the King. Just these royal uh, curtains, bigger than curtains, though. You know, they're, they're tapestries. And then you had the veil that that separated this building. From the holy place and the holy of holies where only the high priest could go in only once a year. And he would go in with the blood to sprinkle on the altar, or not on the altar, but on the, 
the uh, the mercy seat, the covering of the Ark of the of the Covenant. And he would go in there and he'd put the blood once a year on the Day of Atonement, go in and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. And he himself had to be pure. He had already had to be not just physically clean, but he had had to spend some time with the Lord before he went in because if he went in with an unpure heart, if he went in without any, with, with any sin not resolved between he and God, he was dead. They would tie a rope around his ankle because you couldn't go in and get him. So they could pull him back out. And they had little bells at the bottom of his robes. So as long as those bells were ringing, you knew he was still moving. He was still alive. If those bells stopped, and they stopped too long, man, you kind of maybe <laughs> tug on the rope just to see or, or whatever. But you end up, you would have to pull him out because you couldn't go inside the Holy of Holies. You weren't the one appointed to do so. There's only one appointed to go into the Holy of Holies. Listen, I believe this is all a big setup to look like to be an appearance of the throne of God. The mercy seat being the throne of God. We're told in the New Testament, Jesus is our high priest in the book of Hebrews. That he himself took the sacrifice in before God the Father and presented the sacrifice. The only one appointed to do it, the only one who could do it. And it only had to happen one time. He doesn't have to be crucified over and over and over again. That's why the Day of Atonement was one, one time a year. Now you had other times of the year, your own personal needs for forgiveness. If you had to bring an offering uh, or a sacrifice for, for whatever reason, if you go back through the law, you find out there are different reasons you had to bring sacrifices, different sacrifices you had to bring. But you would go to the temple door and there was only one door going in. That's going to be important as we get into John because one of the seven I am statements is I am the door. There was only one way in. And you would go and you would take your sacrifice to that door and the priest would put the knife in your hand and put his hand on your hand and kill the animal. So the blood that, that was there being sacrificed for your sin was literally on your hands. You, this wasn't, you know, go drop it off at the door and walk away and there, I'm forgiven. As long as the priest does it right, I'm forgiven. If he doesn't do it right, well, it's on him, right? It's not on me. It's not my fault. No, this is a very personal form of, of interaction with God coming to, to present offerings for your sin and even peace offerings where you would stay for at least one day, if not two or three days, you would stay in or around the tabernacle and you would share with those who worked there, the Levites and the, and the priests. And the idea was you were, you were eating this meal, you were communing with God. So on the inside we know represents God, on the outside represents Jesus just being a normal looking man. The Bible tells us there's really nothing special about his look. Right? There was no form or comeliness that anyone would want to desire him. Nobody's running after him because he looks good. You know, I mean, if you come to our church, it isn't because your pastor looks good. I'm not one of those guys with the, you know, the cool haircuts and the cool clothes and all that business. Uh, but we have them, don't we? We have the guys, man. You have to have the look. You have to have the voice. You have to have, you know, whatever. I mean, some of those guys, I don't know. They, some of those guys are so popular that shoe companies give them their shoes kind of as an advertisement. Isn't that crazy? But I'm not, I'm not wanting to pollute this with ragging on, on somebody who's not really representing God. I want to stay in that mindset of this is the tabernacle that we're going into. To be right before God. But not anybody, people couldn't just go into the tabernacle. Only the priests and Levites could go in. But what did we see in 1 Peter? The 1 Peter or 2 Peter? Now I don't remember. But that God has made us, made us a royal priesthood. A holy nation. A royal priesthood so we can, like the Levites, serve God. We don't, we don't have to come to him one time and just stay then in that 
lowly condition, that poor condition where we don't interact with God or we only interact with him at certain times. If you're under the impression that the time to interact with God is on Sunday, or maybe if you have a midweek Bible study that you go to, those are the times you interact with God. Those quickly become the times where you're just interacting with the people and you're not interacting with God. And it's just religious. You, you don't want that to be. You want the time that you come to church, certainly, to be interactive with, with each other. We're told to do that. We're commanded that the more that we see the day approaching, we're to come together. We're to be together. So that we can lift one another up. I mean, the days immediately before I believe the rapture of the church, but even the coming of Jesus, the days immediately before are going to get harder and harder, not easier and easier. And it's going to take us coming together. But we come together because we have the common bond that's, that's our, our high priest, that's Jesus, that's our Messiah. And it's his blood covering our sins. That, that's what puts us together where we can then together serve the Lord. Now I think that the, the tabernacle and this kind of drab outside there certainly depicts the first coming of Jesus that we're going to be going through here in, in John. Man, you need to read farther into the Old Testament and see where Solomon builds the temple and, and uh, dedicates the temple and what he made, or, uh, the buildings that were built. And the, the, look at some of the artist's conceptions. I don't think we have anything that really depicts it, but it was an amazing, uh, an amazing undertaking, amazing architecture inside and out. To the point where the, the the temple could be seen from a long ways away. And and so just I believe that that is indicative or, or of his second coming. When he comes in glory. Matthew tells us all the lights go out, man. The sun and the moon give up their light, the stars give up their light. When he's coming, it is the glory of Jesus Christ himself that illuminates everything. Again, we got as far as, as verse 28. We've talked a little bit about John the Baptist. He being Jesus' uh, cousin, like second cousin. because Mary and Elizabeth were cousins. Some believe that Mary and John, the apostle's mother, were, were uh, sisters. Making Jesus and John... Well, and also Jesus and James, James and John, would make them cousins if that's right. I don't know that we have any real proof on that. I don't know if it's outside right. It's obviously, it's not in the Bible, so not anything to hang your hat on as far as you have to believe this or that about it. But that's pretty interesting, isn't it? That the two witnesses that, that we're seeing here, because I think John is going to be one of the first witnesses uh, that, that leaves John the Baptist, uh, to go and follow Jesus. But two of these guys, witnesses of Jesus, are actually, in the human sense, related to him. Now John the Baptist, <laughs> I'm not going to come up with any, people come up with weird names for him just to kind of differentiate the two. I'm not going to do that. Uh he was asked if he was the Christ, uh, and he said no. In verse 19, uh, it says, Now that uh, this is the testimony of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed uh, and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, uh, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Uh, are you the prophet? And he answered, no. 
And I think the prophet there, there there's some debate. Some people think that it was a reference to Jeremiah because uh, there's something about Jeremiah also coming back. But um, I think this is a reference to Moses. The reason why is when you get to the mountain of transfiguration, it's not Elijah and Jeremiah that show up. It's Elijah and Moses that, that show up. So in Deuteronomy 18, Moses talks about one uh, prophet like him that would come and uh, and come back in the before uh, before the Christ or before Jesus the Messiah lost my word there um, anyways he says he's not that prophet he says he's not Elijah although Jesus said in oh boy you know what? Uh, we'll get to it when we get to it. I'm trying to jump, jumping ahead here. So I'm losing my spot. And I'm trying to adjust to new glasses, so that's fun too. Um, anyways, he said he was not those. They said to him, who are you that, uh, that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourselves or about yourself? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. So Isaiah verse 40. So he's the herald of the Messiah, the one coming and saying, the Messiah is coming. You know, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. As we went through Matthew, that's what Jesus preached. In fact, when he sent out the 12, two, two at a time, he told them, this is the message you preach. The kingdom of heaven is near you. It's really not any different now. Uh, well, I believe that Elijah is going to come back. I think Elijah will come back with Moses. I think they're the two witnesses that we see in revelation it's certainly two that come in their spirit right in the, with the same kind of gifts the same kind of motivations the same messages that they had but because of their appearance at the mount of transfiguration when when peter and james and john woke up and saw jesus standing there with moses and elijah that kind of i think is a clue that they're the two witnesses that'll come and and proclaim him uh before his second coming at the end of the tribulation time. But in a sense right now, we're all kind of John the Baptist. We're all called to give the same message. We're to go into all the world and, and preach the gospel, the good news. The kingdom of heaven is near you. It's not far from you. And that, that's not necessarily to mean that, although I think it includes, we're not saying, well, Jesus is coming tomorrow, so you're toast. I mean, then we fall into Jonah's category and, and not John the Baptist's category. Although, I don't know, maybe the, maybe that is what we need, to, we need to teach. I mean, if God would give us a number of days like he did Jonah, <laughs> we just walk through town for three days yelling, 30 days, you're toast, man. 30 days, judgment's coming, that's it. Because Jonah didn't give a great message of, of hope <laughs> to Nineveh. He just went through and said, hey, 30 days, man, and judgment. That's it. And then he walked outside the city to watch it happen. And there was a great revival, a great uh, submission to God. And then Jonah's angry because God doesn't, doesn't destroy Nineveh. Although the message and the warning is fulfilled in Nahum 100 years later when Nineveh didn't take long to turn back around to their old ways and judgment did come and it was wiped out and annihilated by the Assyrians. Anyways, that's a whole other story. Back to John the Baptist. And verse 24 says, Now those who were sent uh, were from the Pharisees. And they asked him, saying, why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who, coming after me, is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethbara, beyond the Jordan, uh, where John was baptizing. Now, there were three reasons why you, why you were baptized in that time 
uh, if you were converting to Judaism. So, I'm, I'm sorry, there were three uh, steps to converting to Judaism. One was instruction. So you entered into, into instruction. So if you wanted to, if you believed in the God of Israel and you wanted to convert to being a Jew, you had to enter into the, the teaching, right? You had to learn the law, the law of Moses. You had to learn the prophets. You had to go through a, kind of a school, if you will, or be a disciple of somebody. And then if you were a male, you had to be circumcised because every male Jew had to be circumcised. But the last thing was baptism. Because you're entering into now this covenant relationship with God. This important relationship. This is a, a relationship that is... Uh, it, it's as though you were born into being a Jew. So the reference of being born again is not necessarily something that was started by Christians. Just a different understanding that we have. They did this and would go into water and and come back out. As, and it, the idea was, it is a, you were as innocent as you were on the day you were born. Now they would have mikvahs in the city, but out even where John was baptizing, I, I, I've not been there, but other people who have say, they had many of these little pools where they were baptizing people out there. But John didn't, John wasn't preaching to non-Jews and baptizing them. And it wasn't a ceremonially unclean thing where, you know, people have become ceremonially unclean. So if you touched a dead body or, or something of that nature, before you could go back to the temple, you had to be washed. You'd have to go and be baptized. You'd have to be in one of these mikvahs and wash. Same thing. Same idea. So John wasn't doing that. So he wasn't preaching to converts. He wasn't preaching to people who were ceremonially, ceremonially unclean. But instead, he was calling the nation of Israel to repentance. And the idea is you, you're, you're so far from God that your identity is in a religion and not in a relationship, not in the relationship with the God you, so, you say you serve. There were many, many laws added to the law of God and the law of Moses. To the point where the those who were in charge of that could manipulate anybody. The, if they wanted to find something on you, they could. And, I mean, and, and, and laws that would let them do things that the law of Moses had no intention of ever letting them do. Now, if you were a man and you were tired of your wife you could divorce her for any reason I mean if she burnt dinner literally you could divorce her for burning dinner but he was preaching repentance because the Messiah was coming repent because the kingdom of heaven is near Same message Jesus preached, same message that Jesus sent out the twelve with. Repent, because the kingdom of heaven is near. To a nation that was far away from God, but they were his. Remember in, in earlier in the chapter, it says he came to his own, but his own would not receive him. So he came to his own. That first mention there of his own is neutral. And so it, it literally means he came into creation or he came to mankind. But his own specifically, his own people that he was born into, would not receive him. I hope, and I don't know that, I don't know, I pray for a revelation, or a revelation, a revival in the church. <laughs> Going to need a revelation if we're going to really have a revival, right? Need, need a revival in the church. This same message should be preached to the church right now. Jesus is coming. At any moment, he could come. Be ready. And I'm not saying we need to line everybody up at a baptismal and start baptizing again. But we need to be ready for the, this other baptism. In verse 33, he says, the one who's coming after him, 
is going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. We're going to see this division between those who really do belong to Jesus, those who really do serve God, and those who don't. Now, this division has been coming for a long time. It, the first evidence of it, I think, is in our, our Christian schools and colleges and universities and seminaries where they don't teach a second coming anymore, where they don't want to talk about the, the crucifixion because it's bloody and gory. And it's translated into the churches where the pastors from those colleges and seminaries have come with messages that are so far watered down they don't teach repentance anymore. It's not important. You can be a carnal Christian. You don't have to change your ways. You don't, God doesn't expect anything of you. He loves you just the way you are. They'll take that. And I can agree with that. But the idea that you don't have to make any changes, that that relationship with Christ doesn't require forgiveness of your sin. And if they won't teach about sin and teach and identify what sin is, how does anybody know? But they don't want to teach these things anymore. It's all progressive now. We all have different thought. Jesus literally has been stripped down from not being God, not being a man, just being an idea. That's literally being taught in churches right now. The idea of Jesus. Well, how does that, how does that set against anything that we've ever preached against before? There are other religions that will say that. Islam will say that Jesus is a good man and a prophet. A prophet just a little lower than Muhammad. But that's not what the Bible says. They'll say even when we get to John 14, I'll probably hammer on this again, so I try not to spend a lot of time on it right now. But the statement when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me, they literally twist and say, I don't even know how anybody could hear this and, and believe it, but that that's not an exclusive statement. That's an all-inclusive statement. How? How can it possibly be an all-inclusive statement? There's a lot of slick talk going on out there. It's going to seem more and more like being we're being John the Baptist. <laughs> where it's just repent. Repent and know God. In verse 29, we're finally getting to where I should have been a half an hour ago probably. Um, it says this, more about John. The next day, John... John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I became, or therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained a upon him I did not know him but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining on him this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit and I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God there's some bold statements here bigger than probably we even realize And it, it does fly in the face of the current condition of the church today. And we can make a lot about it being the American church. But this is a worldwide church. Those churches have sent people all over the world to teach their false doctrines. So it's not any longer just the American church falling away. It's all over the world. You know, I, I have had friends who have been missionaries in Africa. And I have a, a second, I think he's a second cousin, in Belize. And they have to undo a lot. They have to be in opposition against these kind of teachings often that have, that have come into these other countries. 
So the next day, John saw Jesus coming and said, Behold, like, look, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That wasn't just a title. You know, it's not just a, a thing John just threw out there to identify Jesus. The Lamb of God in their mind, in the Jewish mindset, was a sacrifice. It wasn't like he was just going to walk through the country and preach and absorb the sin and take care of it that way. John was saying, that is the sacrifice for the sin. The sin of the whole world. Now, that's not what they wanted from their Messiah. And writings, in, including other writings outside of the Bible, um, see if I can get this name right, Suetonius and Tacitus said that there was an expectation of a world leader and many of them who were writing about it and many of the people in that time, even outside of Israel, were looking to Judah for this leader to come. So they were watching for a leader to rise up and kind of boot Rome out of the picture. But especially in Judaism, they were waiting for their Messiah to come. But this isn't what they wanted from the Messiah. They weren't looking for somebody to come and be a sacrifice. They were looking for somebody to come and conquer and set up his kingdom in rule and reign from Israel and from Jerusalem. They had the, the prophets that prophesied that. They had, I think, one or two teachings that talked maybe two messiahs, one that would come and die and one that would come and conquer. But we know that to be all wrapped up into one, don't we? And we know there are prophecies about Israel themselves one day realizing that their Messiah, they put to death. They sacrificed. They they sacrificed him. They killed him. And they'll, they're going to mourn for what they have done as a nation and be converted. But John is saying, "Look, there's the sacrifice right there. The sacrifice for all this. This message that I'm preaching of repentance. There's the sacrifice for it." That's the sacrifice that will cover the sin that we're talking about now. That I'm calling our people to repent from. Jesus is still that one sacrifice. That moment on the cross is a sacrifice for those of us. We need to remember that. We need to not walk away from it. We need to not forget about it. We need to focus on it more and more. And listen, I think with some interactions that that Tracy and I have had in the last couple of weeks with people that we don't have interactions with either hardly ever or not very often. One, we've never had an interaction with before until two or three weeks ago. But I, I think this has been God, God encouraging us anyways, but together, but me as a pastor, because I'm like, I don't, there's got to be some kind of revival. You go to the the parable of the of the ten virgins, and five are ready and five aren't, and you can see the wake up. Right, that's what revival is to be woken up or to made alive, to have your life breathe back into you, so that you can function and you can you can be good. You can you can do what you're supposed to do. You can have the Holy Spirit in you. The the lamps that they had that were full of oil and ready to be lit at a moment's notice. I think we're seeing a little bit of evidence in this in these three interactions that we've had with our doctor, an eye doctor, and now a postal worker that Tracy had. Pray for her in the post office. On the other side of the counter, behind the glass and all that. And for our nation. That's what they did. They prayed together for our nation in a federal building. She just went in to mail a letter. 
she didn't know that she was a Christian. They didn't know each other were Christians, but you come together, a couple of sentences, a couple of statements, and now you know, and we're going to pray for our nation right here. You go to a doctor, and he wants to talk more about God and more about the Bible and the Bible studies he's teaching and what am I teaching than he does about what's wrong with me. It, it became very much, and it's not that there was a lot wrong with me, but my whatever I was concerned about was secondary to what we were really talking about and what's really important. And that man has ministered to my entire family in the last couple of weeks. Just going in for doctor's appointments. And the eye doctor who got all excited because she, as soon as she found out I was a pastor, isn't it exciting? That was her next said, I'm like, yeah, I knew what she was saying, but I wouldn't want to commit too fast to it. Isn't it exciting? Yeah. Um, so I want to make sure you're not talking about my eyes. We're, we're seeing everything we've been taught. We're starting to see it happen in our lifetime. The mask couldn't hide the smile. And we, the whole time we're doing my eye exam, she's talking about these things and talking about church and talking about worship. And, and I'm like, and none of these people go to our church. None of these people go to the same church that we go to even in another location. They're, none of them are Calvary Chapel. And none of them go to the same church with each other. Listen, it's happening. It may not happen the way I thought it would where people would just come in looking for the truth and be happy to be here and be happy to be with another group of people who love Jesus and love the word. It might, it, hopefully that's going to be part of it. But out in the world where it's not popular, where it's not what you, it's not wanted, out in the, the wilderness is where we're finding each other. May you find somebody who's a Christian, be excited. If it's somebody who is, you, you find out in a couple of, of statements, you find out they really are a born-again Christian who loves God, loves the Word, celebrate. If you got 10 seconds, man, celebrate it. Talk to them. Pray with them. Ask them if, you, if they need anything prayed about and pray with them right then. And don't be afraid of who's around anymore. I might lose my job. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Yeah, so far, the, the non-believers just leave. She said in the post office, as soon as they started talking and made that connection, man, everybody else that was on the other side of the counter left and went in the back. I'm telling you, it's not going to be easy, and you're going to get singled out and whatever else, and, and people won't always treat you good because of it. So what? They didn't treat John the Baptist good. We see how his story ends. You're going, that's not great news, Pastor. Well, it is, though. It is, because what did they do? Send us home. That's, you know, their worst is the greatest thing they could do. Anyways. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after, he, after, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now we know there's stories in the beginning. John was born first. But he's saying he was before me. A man who was before me. Now John's father was a, a priest. We know the story about him getting the the um, the message that his wife Elizabeth in her old age was going to have a child. And so she was already six months along when Mary came to visit, who was just pregnant. And John, as a baby, still in the womb, 
couldn't be still, leapt, Mary, Elizabeth said, at the sound of the voice of Mary who was carrying the Messiah. And so he was before me. John knew, John saying, this man is, and you see there in verse 34, the Son of God, part of the Godhead. He knew Jesus to be eternal and not just a finite man, but eternally there. In verse 31 and verse 33, he says, I did not know him. They were cousins. That doesn't mean they spent a whole lot of time together. But certainly they saw each other growing up. All John is saying is, I didn't realize this was the one. He was just my cousin. He's the one who never got in trouble. <laughs> so I didn't know him. But that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descending on or spirit descending from heaven like a dove. And so you have the, the sacrifice that is a lamb, but now you have the spirit descending like a dove, the sacrifice of the poor. Our Messiah came to relate to everybody. Whether you can afford in this time, you could afford a lamb, or you could only afford a dove. The gift of God is to you. Salvation is to you. The Son and the Spirit and the Father have brought it for us, for them. But the Spirit came on him and remained on him. He says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, so John knows the Father. John has been in prayer. God has spoken to him like he spoke to the prophets. Jesus would even say, John was the greatest of all the prophets. It says, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is the one, or this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John is saying, This baptism we're doing now is a type, it's a picture, it's a shadow of what's to come. This establishing the relationship. It's an outward expression of what's really happening in the heart of people. So we tell people when we baptize them. We're asking you to come and be publicly baptized in front of the church so that you're making a public statement. I identify with Jesus Christ, with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And if you want to enter into the Jewish mindset of this is also the very beginning of and we try to do it at the beginning of your relationship. You get saved, we want to do this quick. I, I, I am more and more leaning toward uh, in, in liking the churches that, man, they have an altar call and people come. They have clothes for them in the back. They're going to baptize them right now. Right now. No classes. No, you know, we check you out for six months. We see if you keep coming. None of that. We're going to baptize you right now. Make the public statement right now. I mean, for a long time, we've said the public statement was coming to the altar. And it is. But there's a public statement, I believe, prescribed in the Bible that says, here it is right here. You're not just coming and asking for somebody to forgive you of your sins. You believe, which Romans chapter 10 tells us, you have to believe that he was resurrected from the dead. That God raised him from the dead. So in baptism, that's part of the statement. I believe. I'm identifying with the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And John says, he is the one who is the son of God. He's more than a man. Hmm. I don't know if I got time. Oh, I wanted to get to chapter two next week. We talk about the wedding in chapter two. All right, well, maybe we'll get through that. There's too much to talk about with the two disciples from John that leave and go, and one is Andrew who calls his brother Peter, and then 
Jesus calls Philip There's, there's too much to cover with all that. We're going to stop. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to stop. Read ahead. If you're online, read ahead. It's so cool. Oh, I'm really having a hard time. It's just cool. It's just the way it all happens. You know, John, John the Baptist. Let me just run through real quick. Let's see if I can do this a little bit real quick. Well, I'm sure we'll have to go over it again next week. But this so is again. The next day, John stood with two two of his disciples, looking at Jesus as he walked. He said, "Behold, the Lamb of God." And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned around, seeing them, said to them, What do you seek? And they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say, when translated, teacher, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of them, or yeah, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the, Mes the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. And then there's Philip, and he just he sees Philip. He just says, "Follow me." Ah. Oh, I want to tear up this stuff. Listen, all right. Two things: John baptized at Bethbara. It means the crossing. This is where we believe that Israel came into the Promised Land. The nation of Israel came in at Bethbara. The nation was symbolically baptized in the Jordan River, the entire nation. Now John is there calling them to repentance, calling them back to remembering and, and starting a new relationship with God. Just one little detail I wanted to get out there. Everything, the details, man, you pay attention to the details. Pay attention to the, to the little details. And dig into God's word and find out what things mean. We're going to see what... Everybody talks about Peter's name being the rock. Nobody ever talks about what Simon means. And often we see him in the Bible. We see him referred to as Simon Peter. Simon means hearing or listening. Anyways, see, now I'm going to get started on that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your words. Thank you for drawing us in, for revealing yourself to us. Lord, for recording the witnesses, for laying things on other people's hearts so many generations ago, that they would write these things down, that they would be inspired by the Holy Spirit, led by the Spirit in their writing. And Lord, for maintaining these for us generation after generation so that we could stand here today and look at the entirety of your word. And Lord, you put so much, even into the details of worship and, and sacrifice. All of these things that we've looked at, even from the Old Testament, that prophetically spoke of you and your coming. What a great and awesome God you are. How amazing it is to serve you. 
I pray you would bless your church today throughout the entire world. In Jesus' name, amen.